I would like to thank the government and the Parliament of Georgia, the Georgia delegation to the OEC Parliamentary Assembly, and the city of Batumi for their warm hospitality. Thanks also to the ambassadors from the OEC Permanent Councils, Council who made the trip to be with us at this conference. Dear friends, we start now our conference with a small change in our program, and I call first our friend, the Speaker of the Parliament of Georgia, David Bakradze. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, distinguished ambassadors, dear friends, it's indeed an honor and pleasure to be here today and to participate in the opening session of this very important conference. So welcome, welcome to Georgia, welcome to Batumi. This is indeed a very important happening for us. The fact that such a distinguished audience gathers in Batumi is of course very important because it gives us an opportunity to share with you what is happening in this country. And visiting Georgia, I believe, is the best way to discover this country. Any country, basically, but including Georgia as well. So you are here to see what's happening in this country. And uh, a lot of things have happened in the last eight years. We're talking about economic cooperation, economic cooperation and economic dimension, economic dimension of security. And one lesson learned from Batumi is that basically the best facilitating factor for economic development is freedom. Because you are today in the region and in the city which eight years ago had very different political environment which was kind of owned by local feudal. And eight years ago Batumi was very different. It was grey, it was just typical post-Soviet city. Today it's very different. And I believe the major factor which contributed to this change is the spirit of freedom which you can feel today, and spirit of transforming the country. And a lot of economic transformations took place in this country in the last eight years. Eight years ago, Georgia was a typical country with typical Soviet bureaucracy, with economy which was a mixture of corrupt and Soviet system. Eight years ago, any entrepreneur, in order to take any license, had to wait for months and months, had to go to tens of different bureaucrats and different ministries. And at the end, the only recipe was giving a bribe. We changed the entire philosophy of doing the business, making the business in the country. We introduced the single window principle, which means that everything is done behind one window, and we even went further introducing so-called houses of justice, which is the single space concept. Any person, public, goes to a single space, which is called house of justice, and they can get any services they need within that single space. And this is not only technical transformation, but this is first of all psychological and moral transformation of the public service in this country. Eight years ago, we started from the system which was heavily corrupt. And I remember the fight, first days of fight against corruption, very difficult and very unpleasant. I was a member of previous parliament when we had to arrest few members of parliament because of corruption charges. All of them were from parliamentary majority. Some of them were our friends and our partners during the revolution. And those of you who are in the parliament, you probably understand what it means when you have to vote for cancelling the immunity of your own colleague and your own friend within the plenary hall. But we did it a few times because it was a very important lesson and example that there are no longer rules which can be broken. There are no longer people who can be tolerated if they are part of the corruption. And all in all, corruption is punishable. And that was a big change in the society which during the 70 years of Soviet rules got accustomed to the corruption and it became kind of social habit and usual way of behavior. So when we started this fight, it was highly unusual to discover that corruption is crime, corruption is punishable, and even if you are a member of parliament, even if you are a minister, even if you are a governor, you will get punished for that. 
that was the beginning of the big transformation of the society. And eight years after we started this transformation, we reached the point where we stand today. Of course, I cannot say that there are no problems in this country today. There are a lot. We still have low per capita income and our economy is still small, although now very healthy. Unlike the economy which we had eight years ago, Georgian economy today is absolutely healthy. It's still small, but it develops in the right direction and what we need now is time for this transformation and changes. We still have people in need. We still have high rate of unemployment. You will still see a lot of housing, housing in this city and other cities which remain from the old times and need fundamental repair and reconstruction. But you will see also signs of changes, big signs of changes. And these are the changes happening in this country. And this changing happened because of all the economic reforms which we undertook. And among those economic reforms, minimizing the government's involvement in economy, minimizing the bureaucratic power to influence the entrepreneurship and economic development was the key approach which we took. And I believe it generates results. There are still problems in this country because if one compares Georgia with Eastern European countries, we had the same level of per capita income in 1989. But then Central and Eastern Europe continues to develop while we had to face all the problems. We had to face civil war, we had to face conflicts in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, we had to face criminality, devastation, corruption, and failed state, which we had. And as a result, in this early 90s, Georgia lost almost 75% of its economy compared to 1989. You can understand what it means when country loses 75% of its economy. So in 2004, after Rose Revolution, we had to start everything from the very, very beginning. And what you see today is the country under construction. It's not only city under construction, because you will see a lot of construction projects around. This is country under construction. And of course, it's sometimes a little bit inconvenient to live in the country under construction, because you will see a lot of things happening around. But on the other hand, that's the best thing to have this feeling that you are building your own country and you transform your own country. This is the great feeling and we, this generation of Georgian politicians, have this luxury to have this feeling that we are constructing our own country. And this is something really, really very important. And I know that many of you intend to come back in October to observe Georgian parliamentary elections. And the important point why these elections matters is not how the parliamentary seats will be distributed among the parties. Of course, I care a lot about my party, but this is not the main thing why I believe these elections are important. The main thing that these elections will give answer to the fundamental question how Georgia's development will continue, whether we will continue all the reforms which we started, or this course and modernization will be questioned and revised. This is the fundamental question. So. And this makes these elections very important. So I call you, dear colleagues, to be here, to observe, to attend, and to be participants of Georgian success, to be participants of Georgian elections, because Georgian elections are part of Georgia's democracy. We are striving here not only for economic reforms, but we are striving to strengthen Georgian democracy, to make it more mature, to make it better established. And elections are an important step in that direction, so I welcome in advance all of you willing and able to come back as an observers in October, because it will be an important occasion to prove Georgian democracy and to strengthen Georgian democratic system and democratic credentials. And of course, we attach, it's out of we need to say how much importance we attach to the cooperation within the OSC and specifically OSC Parliamentary Assembly as well. Because the parliamentary diplomacy is getting more and more important. And I was myself, I spent quite a lot, number of years in the foreign ministry. And when I was in foreign ministry, I was always a little bit irritated when MPs used to be engaged in diplomacy, saying that what politicians have to do in diplomacy, I mean, that's the job of diplomats, that's our job, and whenever they intervene, they just do wrong things. Now I understand how wrong I was myself saying that, 
because now I understand how important political and parliamentary diplomacy is, because that is really the glue, the clue which unites the acting politicians from different countries. And having networks like we do have today is something very important. It's very important to understand each other, it's very important to know better each other, and it's very important to help each other whenever need this kind of assistance from each other. So parliamentary diplomacy is getting more and more important. And of course, parliamentary assemblies and OSCE parliamentary assembly has a, plays a very, very important role with that regard. So this leads me to my concluding point that this is very important organization, very important gathering, very important topic, and very important people. So what else is left to me except saying that you are most heartfully welcome to Georgia and to Batumi. So welcome, and I hope that this conference will be a good working opportunity, but I also hope that it will be a little bit more than working opportunity, because discovering Georgia is not only discovering what kind of economic reforms we did, and discovering Georgia is also discovering culture, identity, heritage of this country. So I hope you will have an opportunity not only to work, but also to discover a little bit of Georgia in this last, in, in, in these next two days. And you know that we Georgians are proud of our wine, not only of our reforms, but our wine as well. And you may know that more than 80% of our wine used to be sold in Russia, on the Russian market. But after Russian embargo, suddenly Georgian wine production lost 80% of its market. So since that, we believe that obligation of all our friends is to help us and to compensate the losses which we got from the closure of the Russian market. So I hope that your friendly contribution to Georgian economy will be important. I hope that you will discover this country, which is really a friendly country. And I hope that after these three days spent here, you will feel home and you will have this sense of nostalgia to Georgia when you go back to your country. So welcome again and I wish you a very fruitful and very nice day in this country. Thank you. Thank you, dear Speaker of the Parliament of Georgia and our friend David Bakradze. Uh, we can assure you that your wine is excellent and has no consequences, <laughs> as you see. <laughs> And now I call uh, our friend, the Special Coordinator of Economic and Environmental Activities of the OSCE, former Minister Goran Zvilanovic. Goran, you have the floor. Efaristopoli, dear Petros, thank you very much. Mr. Bakraze, Speaker of the Parliament, dear Secretary General, Dear members of the Parliamentary Assembly, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and a great pleasure to me to have the opportunity to address this conference convened by the OSC Parliamentary Assembly. Allow me to begin by expressing my appreciation for the initiative of the Parliament of Georgia to invite the Assembly to organize this conference in the beautiful city of Batumi. Mr. Pokrazi, my congratulations. The thematic focus of this conference demonstrates once again the importance attached by the OSC Parliamentary Assembly to strengthening cooperation on economic issues. It is a sign of recognition that economic issues and economic cooperation play an important role in promoting stability and security. As a representative of the OSC's second dimension, I cannot but applaud your efforts and dedication and express my own commitment to further enhance our cooperation towards achieving our common goals. The OSC Parliamentary Assembly, the body bringing together elected representatives from the 56 participating states, offers a meaningful venue for dialogue and brings an important added value in strengthening our organization's capacity to contribute to security and stability in the OSC region. The work of the Parliamentary Assembly enhances the OSC's relevance for the region as a whole. The importance of fostering economic cooperation and stability in the OSCE region has been noted in important OSCE documents like the 2003 Master Strategy document for the economic and environmental dimension, which emphasizes that economic cooperation is necessary to avoid new divisions and to narrow disparities between 
and within our countries in order to achieve sustainable results. I am pleased to note that increasing the effectiveness of our work in the economic and environmental dimension has been quite high on the participating states' political agenda recently. A multi-year process of dialogue and consultations on this topic concluded with the adoption of a permanent council decision at the end of last year in ministerial meeting in Vilnius. Currently, the Economic and Environmental Committee has initiated the process of assessing the implementation of the above mentioned massive strategy, in particular in view of the evolving economic and environmental challenges. Another important development was the successful conduct last year in October of the first economic and environmental Im dimension implementation meeting. Through the above mentioned peace decision, the implementation meeting has become an annual meeting. Paired with the Economic and Environmental Forum, the implementation meeting can and should play a central role in fostering dialogue among participating states as it is the case with more established implementation review meetings in the political, military and in human dimensions, thus contributing to establishing a more balanced approach across all three dimensions. Ladies and gentlemen, let me turn now to an extremely relevant and also topical issue, the promotion and practice of good governance. The issue is topical for the OSC because promotion of security and stability through good governance is the focus of the 20th OSC Economic and Environmental Forum in 2012 under the Irish chairmanship of the OSC. This year's forum process has already gone through the preparatory phase Two very productive and insightful preparatory meetings on the forum were held in Vienna and in Dublin in February and April 2012, respectively. We still have the concluding meeting ahead of us in Prague in September on 12th to 14th. And I cannot stress enough the importance of events like the forum, which facilitate the exchange of best practices and ideas among participating states, OSC institutions, international organizations, representatives of the NGO community, as well as the business and academic, academic communities. And I would like to take this opportunity to call upon all of you to actively support and contribute to the success of this year's forum process. We do hope it will lead to strengthening the OSC's commitments in the field of good governance. Good governance is extremely relevant as it is key to sustainable economic development. It is a fundament and a guarantee of economic stability and growth. It is thus essential in overcoming the financial and economic downturn. The current focus of the Irish OSC Chairmanship on good governance ensures continuity and consistency to our work in the second dimension. In this context, I am pleased to mention that next week, on May 14 and 15, my office, together with the OECD and the UNODC, will organize in Bishkek an expert seminar on asset declarations for public officials, a tool to fight corruption in Central Asia. I would like to highlight the elected officials, including members of parliament, have an important role to play in fostering a culture of integrity, transparency and accountability, free from corruption and money laundering. In that regard, my office stands ready to explore cooperation opportunities with the OIC Parliamentary Assembly. We also support the work of our colleagues in ODIR to assist interested countries in introducing professional and ethical standards for parliamentarians. And I applaud to the words shared only a few minutes back by the Speaker of Parliament or the activities undertaken by this government in Georgia during the last few years. My office and the OSC field operations have a valuable track record of activities in support of the OSC participating states in promoting good governance and transparency with a view to strengthen social economic development. And I will give you just one example of an activity conducted here in this beautiful city in Batumi in November 2009, when with the support of the government of Georgia, we organized a regional seminar of fighting corruption in the area of transport infrastructure development in the South Caucasus. It facilitates information exchange on effective policy mechanism and legal frameworks in public tendering and bidding processes. Good governance in economic matters is essential to attracting foreign investments. 
countries prosper when they create and maintain a favorable, favorable business environment with clear, simple and transparent laws and with strong and accountable institutions. It is obvious that parliamentarians can do a lot in this regard in establishing a legislative framework con conducive to business development. Another aspect of good governance that was high on our agenda is good governance in transport and at border crossings. Together with our partners in the UNEC, we launched at the beginning of the year a handbook a, of best practices at border crossings, a trade and transport facilitation perspective. We advocate inter alia for the adoption and implementation of relevant international conventions and for the transportation into national legislation of recognized effective practices. Effective and secure transport and cross-border trade underpin economic growth and development which are among the highest priorities for all our countries. Transport brings countries, people and business together. It facilitates and stimulates regional cooperation. The OSCE can and should continue to support such efforts. The city of Batumi is a privileged place to discuss these issues as we are here at the crossroad of important transport corridors between Europe and Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude by emphasizing once again the importance of the economic and environmental dimension to the OSCE comprehensive approach to security. The OSCE Parliamentary Assembly has always been a strong advocate and a promoter of closer and meaningful cooperation in confronting economic and environmental challenges in the OSCE region. And I'm therefore looking forward to our deliberation over the coming days and to outcome of this conference. I'd like to thank you very much for your kind attention. Mr. Speaker of the Parliament of Georgia, dear colleagues, dear ambassadors, it is not a farewell speech because I'll deliver this speech in Monaco. So, <laughs> is just my contribution to our economic conference that we start here today in Batumi. As we open this economic conference, we underline that along with the military and the humanitarian dimensions, economic cooperation as an integral part of the OECD's comprehensive approach to security. More than anyone, the citizens of Batumi are aware that economic success and political stability are closely connected. They also know that both require hard work and concrete planning. Enterprise is rooted in the history of Ajara. It is here, to this ancient land of Colchis, that Jason sailed with his Argonauts in a quest to seize the Golden Fleece and thus legitimize his claim to his father's kingdom. It is here by these mountain, mountains that Jason, with the help of Medea, overcame three epic challenges laid before him to clutch the Golden Fleece. With today's economic crisis, we too, citizens and parliamentarians of the OECD region, have had to endure challenges to safeguard the economic prosperity of our children and prove, as we do through democratic elections, our legitimacy to govern. I welcome the President of the Republic of Georgia, our Dear President, you came here at the time when I said that we have challenges in front of us, so you are part of this debate about what is challenging us. 
So I repeat, with today's economic crisis, we too, citizens and parliamentarians and presidents of the OEC regions, have had to endure challenges to safeguard the economic prosperity of our children and prove, as we do through democratic elections, our legitimacy to govern. This past Sunday, as you know, my party and I lost in the elections in my country. Knowing the consequences that may be dire for our own political career, careers and my own political career, we had voted for two and a half years hard measures to implement austerity measures in order to keep Greece, my country, in the Eurozone. Because I deeply believe that it is time for integration of our nations, not for separation. It is not a time, the time, for isolation. So we pay the price to save our country and we lost our careers. I do prefer this than anything else. Elsewhere, many of our colleagues have, have placed our common ideals and the value of a unified European economy and stable national budgets sometimes above the very interests they may have spent their whole life supporting schools, health care, pension system on which our citizens depend. Make no mistake, this too is courage. But we need to change. We need a change in our economic policies. Because despite the painful decisions taken in my own country, in Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Italy, and across the OEC region, we know that austerity cannot go on forever. It is not the answer. Over the past few years, the urgency of the crisis has led some governments to bypass political debate. And too often, parliaments of OEC participating states have been reduced to putting seals, a seal of approval on austerity packages decided by all our own governments. It is time we, as parliamentarians, return to our proper role of providing the needed oversight and debate on spending cuts, which not only target the budgetary excesses of the past, but limit our investments in the future. We must enhance policies for growth and social cohesions in our societies. Dear colleagues, Jason traveled to these lands in order to reclaim his father's kingdom from the usurper Peleus. In Batumi's Europe Square, I have seen the statue of Medea holding the Golden Fleece, and that reminds us of Jason's legitimate claims. Across our regions, bureaucrats and economists, governments and parliaments have tried to stay on a course to continue economic unity. But it's time for us to say clearly that we cannot continue down this path of perpetual cuts forever, lest we surrender the very concept of a democratic government elected by and for the people. As the link that we are between the people and the decision that affect them, we strive to balance our citizens' short-term goals with national and international long-term needs. As representatives of the people, we have a special role to play in educating our constituencies about the economic policies we vote to implement, but we have to persuade them that those policies are for them. As parliamentarians, we have a duty to debate and close, closely oversee those policies. During our recent Bureau meeting in Copenhagen, 
discussions pointed out that the time has come to rethink our approach to tackling the economic crisis. I believe that this economic conference and our annual session will result in frank discussions that will lead to the adoption of a timely document in Monaco because Europe needs a new Marshall Plan for, for growth and recovery. It is time for great decisions from all our parliaments and from all our governments in the OEC region. We cannot go like that. We need a new Marshall Plan for growth, development, prosperity and social cohesion in the extended, extended European area that is practically the OEC also. In July, May, we, the parliamentarians from the OEC 56 participating states, emphasize new ways to stimulate growth and put an end to economic stagnation. Honorable members, dear colleagues, the tale of Jason is a founding myth for many cities along this shores. As the first ones to sail through the powerful currents of Bosporus, the Argonauts showed the Black Sea to be a welcoming body of water and encouraged ancient Greeks to expand their trade network. Their dedication to commercial expansion and, expansion and prosperity is no different than the desire for economic success we share today. In a region colonized by Greece, dominated by Rome and Constantinople, and later occupied by the Ottoman and the Russian Empire, the citizens of Batumi know firsthand that their fortune is inextricably linked to their neighbors. The people of Azara understand the benefits of economic cooperation. They know that in tough times we must resist the tendency to close our borders, reduce trade effectively, go it alone, and instead lean on each other even more. In this spirit, I look forward to our discussion and hope we all take this opportunity to directly exchange new ideas to overcome our common economic challenges. In Batumi, I have heard last year from the President of Georgia, the Honorable Misa Sakazvili, his dream, that is a model for development. And we can see here the positive results of a good and concrete planning for development. In Batumi, in a city where economic success has helped stabilize a larger region, let us be reminded that such economic cooperation has always been an integral part of the OEC's comprehensive approach to security. Thank you, dear colleagues. Thank you. And I call now the President of the Republic of Georgia, the Honorable Misa Sakasvili. You have the other one, President. Dear Mr. President, thank you for this very wonderful speech and um, thank you for being here. Uh, when you walk in this city of Batumi, it's very hard to imagine for those of you who are the first time here that five years ago it was the city basically in ruins. It was one of the darkest, least, 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 least city in the world. It was very chaotic. It had basically only one or two kilometers of paved roads. It had none of these hotels that you see on the seafront, none of these new buildings. And basically, it was run by a warlord that would drive around in uh, 
20 or so Humvees because no other car could go through the streets here, they were so bad, with his uh, dark glass bodyguards, with uh, uh, Kalashnikovs, and basically looking around him very menacingly and uh, scaring people. And when if you look at the, so the symbol of the Batumi is a symbol of changes for Georgia. But when you look also back in Georgia, where we were, it was an amazing country in terms of being basically totally failed state. We were one of the most corrupt countries in the world. We had one of the highest criminal rates in the world. We were the same thing to um, former Soviet countries and uh, some of the European countries as Palermo used to be to Western Europe and to the United States in the last century. Uh, we were, um, we had one of the highest levels of cynicism. Police was not paid any salaries. Police had to collect bribes and pay on the contrary to their superiors. This also concerned the state apparatus. The president, my predecessor, said publicly what you want. We cannot fight corruption because everybody is corrupt anyway. Uh, so what's the use of fighting it? Uh, and he would say it publicly. And uh, he would also say that you know, what, what can I do? My relatives are very talented in business. What's wrong with that? Uh, and that was accepted by societies or part of society, including international one. So we were very in bad, very bad shape. Aware of that the half reforms would be useless, that our windows of opportunity was very small, we took over. And we took over with a very radical, um, drastic agenda of change. We should realize what we did in Georgia because otherwise it's hard to explain how a country where, which is official, technically, according to its hundred times bigger neighbors, is at war with its neighbor because that neighbor does not recognize our borders, does not recognize our government, wants our government officially out. They want to depose us and they're saying it. The neighbor that doesn't even recognize ceasefire agreement that it itself had signed. We still had 7% growth last year. We are expecting 8 to 9% this year, and hopefully we'll go back to double digits starting from next year. And most of it is investment driven. Why does it happen? How can Georgia succeed? How can Georgia survive? This is a country where poverty rate has gone down from 52% down to 20% in the last um, six years. Uh, where unemployment had gone, don't, gone down from 25% down to 14%. It's still dramatically high, especially in the cities, but it's still a big progress. Where the GDP has grown almost four times in nominal terms for the last for, uh, eight years. And where, as I said, uh, the, there is a, this thing where there is still considerable optimism because 60% as minimum for the last two or three years of the population says it's going in the right direction. To understand it, we should understand that we have done dramatic transformation. For instance, we fired, basically, in Georgia, 99% of civil service was replaced. 99%. 100% of policemen initially, but basically 100% of customs officials, 100% of uh, tax officials, 100% of ministry employees, at central level, basically nobody is left. 80% of uh, civil service are young people under 30 in central ministries, which is another thing that distinguishes Georgia. Uh, I'm actually, if you don't, with one ex exception of foreign minister, I'm the oldest member of our government, um, and everybody else, including the civil service in our government, is younger. And of course, as you go to the age, it's not a terribly popular thing to say, oh, you know, we don't get older people. But that's not the point. The point here is that I was in last year of the university when Soviet Union collapsed. I didn't work so in the Soviet Union. Uh, I, I vividly remember it quite badly. But I didn't have any experience of working experience under it. We have even ministers in our government. We have lots of MPs who don't even remember it. And in this case, not remembering it, not having experience is a huge asset. Because experience was that of corruption of cynicism, the way how the country was ruled. For instance, how people were divided in ethnic groups, in religious groups. And you know, even today, if you look carefully, some of the 
best finance groups of opposition are using this religious hatred and ethnic hatred rhetorics, but it's totally marginalized in Jordan society. The biggest compliment of what we've done in terms of integrating minorities came in 2008 on two instances where R Russian tanks came into, uh, first of all, those areas in Skin Valley region, what they call South Ossetia, where we had, uh, where we were, uh, where we had full control before that. And they came in and 90% of local population was ethnically Ossetian and they told me, hello, we are here to liberate you. And almost 100% of them have has left together with Georgian police. And most of the IDPs, internally displaced persons, today in refugee camps, in IDP camps in Georgia, they are not camps, they are basically small towns, are ethnically Ossetians. Maybe though most of you don't know, but that's whom Russians expelled. The remaining population of uh, uh, so-called South Ossetia is now around six to 7,000 people left. Um, uh, all the others went to other parts of Georgia. Um, and then they came to Armenian areas in Georgia, the ethnic Armenian areas, and they said, and they've just left that area. They had military base there three years before that. And this was the only employer, two years before that, this was the only employer that was in that area. So when that base was leaving, there was some reluctance on the part of local population saying, you know, we are losing the only employer. So when they came back, they immediately rushed to that area and um, uh, to say, here we are, we are back, be happy. And they were expecting that they would be met with the flags. And, you know, they were met by local population, local police force, very lightly armed. And commander of the local police force, he stopped Russian tanks, he told them, call Moscow, we are all ethnically Armenian here, we are all police is Armenian, we, are, we just have all these light weapons, but we will all die, and only after we all die you can enter our area. But call Moscow that you are now going to kill Armenians here. And after several hours of hesitations, these tanks really called their commanders and they turned back. That would not have been possible just five, six years ago. So that's the change that has really emerged in this society that it has become multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, in real sense, because there is a sense of entitlement and sense of equal opportunities. Every kid in Georgia, when they get into schools, get a laptop and they get an American or British or Australian to teach them English, because we've invited more than 2,000 of native speakers of English professors to teach English, to move society to being English language, and I believe that within the next three years, 80% or to 90% of Georgian youth will be totally ang anglophone, which is very important to get access to modern information. Every kid gets, uh, I mean, we, we've got, uh, every kid gets uh, computers at the uh, computer classes which are modeled after uh, publicity of a cell phone company. And it's, it costs us a lot, but basically we have the claim that in three, four years, our schools will be just as good as schools in, uh, not only just in continental Europe, but hopefully in Japan or South Korea, because we are equipping them very well. Uh, we have, we've got 150 new hospitals built, brand new hospitals built in Georgian regions. You get an area where you have uh, no running water sometimes, although we have also a program to make running water in, um, or basically in all places of Georgia, and we are spending $2 billion on that now. But we, you get into areas where there is no running water, and you get a hospital where rooms are like five-star hotels. And in a person who, and half of the population will be insured already this year, but we have program to have full insurance uh, in two years for now, full insurance of the population. If a person from that area gets into a hospital which looks like a five-star hotel, even if they go back to their house, which is really miserable, you know, they go back with change mentality. They do no longer want, maybe, they've seen something else. They would never make it to the Sheraton Hotel, but they've been in the hospital across the street of their house. Or they've been, or they, their kid goes every day to a very modern school, gets a laptop, has an American teacher. They don't want to get back into poverty or to grow back in this poverty. We also are making, the, we've also made 20 technical schools in conjunction with Americans here in Georgia, and we are building an American technology university in Batumi, which will, which will be just in front of this hotel. And if you look at it today, you will not believe me, but in, um, Two, three months time, actually, it will be 200 meters tall, high, 
a new university, the highest building in the Caucasus, that will be a technology university for the Georgians and for foreigners that will study abroad. We are also doing European college here in Batumi, where we'll have, together with the European Commission, we'll have uh, students from all over the region, because anybody, ever, all of them can enter Georgia for free, uh, for, with the visa free. So, so I think the, really what really happened in Georgia is a mental revolution. I think today Georgians have totally cha changed the way they think of themselves, of their prerogatives, of their responsibilities, and of their relationship with the society and the government. Police had 5% confidence rate seven years ago. Now it's 90, highest in Europe. As I said, we were one of the most criminalized societies in the world. Now, if you look at the European Union survey done for the last three years on perceptions of crime, Georgia is the safest country in Europe, repeating, safest country in Europe. We were competing only with Iceland for a few years, but now we are ahead of Iceland on that figures. Half of organized crime bosses in Russia are from Georgia, by the way. Uh, so, you know, people, crime migrates where they feel themselves more comfortable. They don't feel comfortable anymore in Georgia. Uh, we have the... Uh, we have the world's fastest customs procedure. You know, the average track in a customs office next to Batumi, for instance, to go through it takes around seven minutes. And uh, I had a uh, head of state here who basically, and I told him, you know, the average track driver gets, takes seven minutes to go through customs, no matter what's the cargo. If it's more than one hour, all the customs officers that have to do anything with it, or people who work there, they, they will be fired. And he laughed at me and he said, where do you get such customs offices that would work for such conditions? Because the assumption was that all customs offices have to be a little bit corrupt, or at least lazy. Or, and then what we, and they said, let's go, let's go. And we went there and we looked at them and said, look at them, they are not even customs officers. We fired all of them. We don't have customs officers. We have just young people, uh, some girls or guys, some of them from model agencies, uh, sitting there to smile and say a few phrases in foreign languages. But otherwise, everything is done by computers. We don't give discretion to our bureaucracy. We don't trust them. We had bad experience. And that's how things should move. If, we, if agency doesn't work, you fire the whole agency. You annihilate the function. But you never allow them to humiliate your citizens. You know, the biggest, the biggest Problem was not eradicating corruption. According, as you as you know, 0.1 percent of Georgians say in the polls they've heard anything about corruption. It was 98 percent seven years ago. 0.81, 0.1, which basically means corruption is next to next to none. But eradicating corruption was not the biggest issue. The biggest issue was to change mentality of civil service that they are there to humiliate their citizens, and. You know, and let me explain it, because recently I criticized some European embassies here in Tbilisi, saying that if you want to remember how our bureaucracy looked six years ago, go to some European embassies when they issue visas, and they will, they will vividly remind you. And they were, ambassadors were little angry at me, but I think I still stick to these words. I'll tell you why. Because if you have something you have to give to somebody else, and that somebody else comes to your office, then there is a huge temptation for any bureaucrat to drag, uh, you know, feet, to humiliate, to little bit look down on the applicant, to say, okay, I have something you want, now you better show your respect towards me. And this, this should be exactly the opposite. And to change that mentality that took us lots of time, it's still not fully changed, but I think it's, we are almost there. First of all, we have a new generation. Second, they know that they are there to serve their people. We force people to go out and to make exhibitions. I mean, we compel them, to, uh, young members of our civil star, to make competitions of every minister, every minister, prime minister, myself, went to small towns, made exhibitions, saying, okay, that's what our minister is doing. Please, you know, uh, and we distributed T-shirts from ministries, caps, brochures, saying, here we are to serve. That's the service we provide. Please use it. And that's the mentality. We didn't so much do it for public relations. It wasn't even an election year. But basically, we did it to show our civil service why they are there, why they have to you know, sell themselves to the public all the time, that the government is just a service. It's there to provide and to facilitate advancing of the society. 
And that's, I think, it's very important to understand what's really happening here. Um, and then, of course, empowering all the society is extremely important. And uh, creating equal opportunity, because Georgia was ruled by, from, it's a country of 4.7 million people at this point. We were ruled from one street in Tbilisi for the last 10 centuries. One street. People in that street, I mean, for the last hundred, uh, at least, I mean, for the last, I was born next to this street, I can tell you. Uh, I remember the last 40 years how it worked. I mean, everybody went to the, all the universities were there, all the ministers lived there, all the central committee employees lived there, all the, um, you know, uh, representatives of this uh, uh, ruling empire lived there, and we couldn't give a damn about what the other five million of Georgians, they couldn't give a damn about what the other five million Georgians fought. And we totally reversed it. And you, you know, most, because most of the bureaucrats lived there and they were all fired and it's next to government buildings, they could always, you know, you could always recruit enough people for protest rallies against the government in Tbilisi, for instance, but the country has changed. The capital has changed amazingly well. The whole transformation has, new, new, new uh, generation has come. And those who were always deprived from old generations, they've got new opportunities. So as a result, we are moving parliament to Kutaisi. We are decentralizing the country. We already moved uh, the uh, constitutional court in Batu Batumi. It works very well. Kutaisi is an amazingly spectacular country, a made with grandiose building of new parliament, uh, amazingly spectacular place and uh, city. But the idea behind it is that when you build meritocracy, equal opportunities, it's also equal opportunities for regions. It's also equal opportunities for suburbs. It's also equal opportunity for all social classes, including people from deprived families. That's when society really moves forward. And from that point of view, I think we've done, we have done some job, we still have some way to go. And um, with regards to our geopolitical situation, you know that we have almost half a million multi-ethnic group of Georgian citizens expelled from their houses. This was not ethnic cleansing of Georgians in Sarolde. We have lots of, for instance, Greeks, 30,000 Greeks were expelled from Abkhazia. Uh, we have um, uh, lots of Jews, Ukrainians, Estonians, Ossetians, half of the ethnic Abkhaz, 100% of ethnic Georgians expelled from most areas of South, former South Ossetia, Skhin Valley region and from um, Abkhazia. And, uh, and we have in one place almost no population left and in another only less than 20% of pre-war population. We have troops that don't allow people back and these troops are there under the flag of Russian Federation. And despite this fact, we declared the policy of constructing unilateralists towards Russia. We had uh, we, we, we issued the or decree that Russian citizens can under, enter Georgia without visas. No, any Georgian, it's hardly possible for any Georgian to enter Russia. And we, will, we expect one million Russian visitors this year or only, already. Despite several very strong statements by Russian foreign minister that it's dangerous for Russians to visit Georgia. I even suggested to hire Mr. Lavrov as our tourist agent because it, after his statements, the tourist numbers gonna, has gone up considerably. Thank you for you know, paying attention at the touristic opportunities in Georgia. And, and, and I, I mean it, I mean that's what happened. I'm not being sarcastic about it. Uh, so what I mean is that, and then the amazing thing is that, and we, we of course we supported Russia's uh, yes, uh, membership in WTO, even if no Georgian goods ever go to Russian market. Uh, we used to import 90% of our electricity to Russia, from Russia, and now we are exporting it electricity to Russia, so that's the only commodity that goes there, nothing else goes. But um, we believe that still abiding by some rules is good for international system and international regimes. Um, and uh, guess what? Uh, I mean, Lots of Russian officials have been coming here, or 
lots of Russian opposition members have been coming, uh, have been studying and raising Georgian reforms as their flag for change. They've been saying continuously that we need Georgian reform to, uh, as a guideline how Russia can change. We, we, we've seen lots of Russian businesses coming here, businessmen coming here. Indeed, there are lots of Russian investments also in this city. And two or three days ago, Russian former president and now Prime Minister Medvedev, who was in his confirmation hearings in Russian Duma, when asked about Georgia reforms by, uh, at the uh, hearing where he had to be confirmed, said the following. You know, I hate Saakashvili, but uh, one has to acknowledge that Georgia has done successful reforms, and we have to copy and implement them in Russia. Wow. That's quite remarkable. This is a hundred... When did it happen in history last time when Russia invaded some country, didn't oust its government, couldn't oust its government, couldn't occupy most of territory, that the government survived, that the country survived overall, and a few years after that, Russian invader has said, wow, it's interesting to look at, maybe we should learn from them how to rule our own country. And that's the most powerful testament to what George, what George Georgia stands for in this region, and also including the Russians, and I think hopefully Europe-wide. Because it stands for, it's a remarkable story of survival and success against all the odds. And we have elections now in October, and this is, I think, the last, I mean, it's very important on the one hand for Georgian credentials, but it has also a huge security dimension to it. And OSC is organization for security and democracy at the same time. And it has security dimensions to it because in parallel to our elections, our northern neighbor has called for big trainings of their troops exactly in parallel time of elections. They moved it one month later or two months later. They would usually do it in summer. And now they've supplemented it with uh, ODKB, so-called collective organization, mass training, at the same time, exactly at the timing of our elections. Now, politically it makes no sense. I mean, because if you do such things, you only help your adversary to win elections, right? Unless there is something from some plan to really follow up and deliver on your threats. And that's why we need as many observers as we can get. We have strong attempt here to delegitimize our elections. We have groups here that in advance already today declare that elections will be rigged by the government and they cannot be legitimate. They have enough money to recruit lots of people who would come and testify, so-called their foreign observers, there are enough people abroad as well, unfortunately also in European countries, who would come and for money say just anything. But we, that's why we need genuine organizations. That's why we need genuine pro-democracy parliamentarians, genuine observers, genuine transparency starting from today, not just the day of elections, on media monitoring, on financing, on political party, freedom of political activities, on uh, the whole electoral process. For us it's like Almost the last line when can Georgia can go, go break through and become a full-fledged European democracy, but also make Georgia survival and that most of the success I've been talking about irreversible. From that point of view, we are counting on your help. We are counting on uh, your understanding and focus. I know there are lots of things going out, out there. Lots of you have come, despite the fact that many European countries had elections, very dramatic ones for the out future of Europe and for all of us. But we are very grateful that against this background, which is complicated, you still made it to us because your presence here has a very reassuring and cheering effect for my nation. Thank you again for this great opportunity to address you. Thank you, Mr. President. Your speech is uh, more than a contribution to work to the work of our economic conference. And now, 
uh, we have no uh, stop for coffee as usual and I call Valpurga von Hagsburg Douglas, our Vice President, to come here and chair the second part of our economic conference.